Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Jack A. Bear lived upstairs, in 2B. It was a 16 by 16 room, plenty big enough for his needs. The beige carpet was only 12 by 16, going the length of the room, but ended four feet from the small kitchen. There, the owner had put fairly nice linoleum tiling. The linoleum tiling extended to the small bathroom. Jack had put a simple bath mat in the small bathroom, and that small bath mat nearly took up all the available floor area. But that was good enough for him. He had not needed that much, had not wanted that much. Jack A. Bear certainly did not need the 3,200 square foot home his wife had insisted they buy. At first, he had objected. There was just him, her, and their 16 year old daughter. They simply did not need that much room. Especially since Deidre would surely be moving out in just two years' time. The girl had been talking of nothing but going to Florida State ever since seeing a photograph of the college campus. But as usual, Jack gave in and put down the 25% down payment, $52,500. Then, two years after Deidre moved out, Jacqueline hit him with the usual, we've grown apart, and it's not you, it's me, and this will help us reconnect. He wondered how a 47-year-old woman taking a 31-year-old lover was supposed to help them reconnect. But to Jacqueline's surprise, Jack had not capitulated this time. He had not simply caved. You'll end up with nothing. She screeched, normally pretty face twisted in an ugly snarl when he informed her he was moving out. That's fine. At least I won't end up with a wrinkled up old 304, he said and finished packing his suitcase. Miller's electronics sold him the equipment. Hiding them around the large home was easy. Jacqueline was less than scrupulous in her housekeeping, less than observant in her surroundings. He found out that Jacqueline's paramour was a teacher at Baylor Lake High School. That was how they'd met. Brian taught English and Jacqueline was the librarian. Jacqueline and Brian thought Jack should just go along with the plan. They'd have their fling. Then Brian would go home to his wife and Jacqueline would go home to her husband. But Jack A. Bear did not wind up being the head accountant for St. Elizabeth Public Utilities by being sloppy. He became the head accountant by being careful, meticulous. As they'd arranged, Brian and Jacqueline went as sweet peas for that night's fried catfish dinner. And Brian's parents were there, sitting at a table. A shamefaced Brian introduced Jacqueline as a co-worker. So, where's Michelle? Brian's mother asked pointedly. She's a, she's at home, with the girls, Brian stammered. Yes, she told us, his father snapped. Said you had some sort of parents-teachers conference or something going on at school tonight. Uh, yeah, yes we uh, we do. But there was a little break so we had decided to grab a bite to eat, Brian stammered. Uh-huh, both Brian's parents said, letting him know they didn't buy his lame excuse. After a silent dinner, the no longer quite amorous couple went to Foxtrot's lounge for a little dancing. Jacqueline loved to dance, but Jack didn't care much for it, having two left feet. And at Foxtrot's, Jacqueline's mother and stepfather were dancing. Yes, darling, your husband slipped Roger here a couple hundred bucks, told him take me here for a little dancing and drinking. Her mother giggled. Then she looked at Brian and raised an eyebrow. But uh, what are you doing here? She asked her daughter. We uh, well... You know Jack doesn't much like to dance so uh, Jacqueline stammered. Come on, Monique, they're playing our song, Roger insisted. That is not our song, you silly old coot, Monique laughed, but allowed herself to be dragged back out onto the dance floor. But Jacqueline was determined to go through with her fling, if for no other reason than to show her stick-in-the-mud husband that he wasn't about to ruin her evening. That was fine with Brian, the dancing and dinner had just been a means to an end for him. Damn. Nice house, Brian whistled as he pulled up to the South Shore Baylor Lake home. Thank you, Jacqueline simpered. They entered the house, with Brian giving Jacqueline's flabby backside a generous squeeze. Hello, Brian, Michelle said from the living room couch. Aya, what? What are you doing here? Brian almost screamed. Oh, I thought I'd show your wife and your daughters where you'd be living, Jack A. Bear said, coming into the room with a box of things. Hi, Jacqueline. I just stopped by for a few more of my things. I done told you yeah, Michelle said, voice a tightly controlled whisper. I done told you, after Stacy, I told you that's it. The pregnant woman hefted herself out of the far too soft couch, walked over to Brian and gave his face a stinging slap. Well, looks like y'all have a lot to talk about, so I'll be going now, Jack smiled. The girls really love the swimming pool. You son of a witch, Jacqueline snarled at a smiling Jack. Uh-huh, by the way, y'all owe Danny twelve bucks for babysitting Mealy and Mandy tonight, Jack said pointing to the neighboring girl that was splashing in the pool with the two girls. Then he left the house. 
They had nearly $84,000 equity in the house. Jacqueline screamed, cried, and begged Jack for forgiveness. She did not want to lose the house or the nearly $17,000 of furniture she'd accumulated. Her brand new Mercedes Benz still had three more years on the note. Jacqueline begged and pleaded and cried for Jack to forgive her. She knew she could not afford the car on her salary. And she nearly fainted when Parker Johnson, her attorney, relayed the news. Jacqueline would be responsible for half of Deidre's tuition and living expenses as long as the child was in college. She also found it quite difficult to make ends meet on the salary of a public school librarian. Oh no, honey, Monique laughed a tight little laugh when Jacqueline approached her mother with the idea of moving in with them. But it's just until I can. Jacqueline whined. Honey, it's a two-bedroom condo, Roger said. I am so grateful your father isn't alive to see this, Monique said. She fixed her daughter with her customary raised eyebrow. Remember? Monique asked. You brought the Jack a bear boy home, and your father said to you that boy's a snake in the grass. Boy would he be shocked to see just how wrong he was. Their oldest, John Jr. called his dad. Dad, mom's asking us if she can stay here, JJ said. Son, you got the room. Then by all means, let her stay, Jack said. Well, it's a, I just don't want it. I don't want any problems, JJ admitted. Son. That woman changed your poo-poo diapers, cleaned you up, fed you all those years. If you got the room, give it to her, Jack said. Love you, Dad, JJ said. Michelle Malankin was true to her word. She did not forgive Brian his attempted little fling. Brian found that living on half his salary was not feasible and wound up moving back home with his parents. But at least, those living arrangements gave Brian's parents plenty of time with Amelia and Amanda, their two granddaughters. And when Michelle gave birth to Barry Malankin, named after her father, they got to see him often as well. Barry? I thought we were going to name him after me, Brian whined. We was, Michelle snapped. But your little tool made sure there ain't no we anymore. Jack had intended for the apartment to be a temporary thing, but found he enjoyed not spending hours cutting the grass, or raking leaves, or mulching a garden, or planting flowers, or vacuuming out the pool. He found he enjoyed not changing the wallpaper, painting the spare bedroom, pulling out the old carpet. Jack found out he liked not having to clean the garage, or the attic, or the tool shed. There was a closet in his apartment. He found it held 12 suits, 12 dress shirts, and 24 ties just fine. It also held three pairs of shoes, a long overcoat, and a short jacket just fine. The small set of drawers in it held his four pairs of jeans, his 12 pairs of underwear, his 12 pairs of socks, and his four pullover shirts just fine. The furniture was minimalistic as well. Jack had his favorite recliner two bookshelves, a small table and two dining chairs, and a full-sized bed. He did not even have a television. He had thought briefly of availing himself of the television in Deidre's room, but couldn't think of a single television show he would want to watch. Jack A. Bear was an avid Saints fan, but Red Sports Bar had a 61-inch LCD television and ice-cold beers and insanely spicy chicken wings and ice-cold beers and jalapeno-laden nachos and ice-cold beers. If there was a television program he just had to watch, he could stream it on his laptop computer. He had found he liked to cook. Jacqueline was always screeching that he was making a mess whenever he attempted to cook. But here, it was either microwave endless frozen dinners, or actually learn to cook. So he learned to cook. Jack was driving home one evening. A coworker had given him a new recipe for blackened chicken, and he happened to have some leg quarters, when he happened to look over at a colorful building. Jack had driven the same path day in and day out, had passed this building day in and day out. Why he would have decided to look over at this moment was unanswerable to him. The curtains were open. He was looking at a plate glass window of Kizzy's school of dance. And inside were seven couples, twirling and gliding. A car horn brought him out of his trance and Jack turned and pulled into the parking lot of the building. Then he sat in his car and watched. He watched as an attractive young woman. Beatific smile on her pretty face showed them some basic movements, then waved for them to start again. Even though he could not hear the music, the fluid motions of the people dancing filled Jack's head with music. Then the class must have been over. Some couples stood around and chatted. Others walked out into the twilight and got into their cars. Jack made a decision and got out of the car. Hi, help you. The young dance instructor smiled, breaking away from an older couple. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a couple, but do you teach individuals? God, that was just so beautiful, watching them dancing like that. Jack stammered, now wondering why he was in there. Kizzy smiled wider and grasped his nervous hands into her own warm hands. Boy, is this your lucky day, she insisted. 
Okay, Jack said, not feeling very lucky. Come on, let's take a look at what we can do, Kizzy said, pulling him to the counter. He agreed to sign up for her 12-week program and agreed he would be there that Wednesday night. Six o'clock and I'll introduce you to your dance partner, Kizzy said, handing him his charge slip. Oh boy, this is my lucky day, Jack smiled. Even as he cooked his dinner, Jack couldn't help but hum the music he'd heard in his head as those couples had danced in front of his eyes. Jack had met Jacqueline Adams at Cabrini High School. She and her family had just moved from Stepping Stone, Louisiana so that her dad could start working at the Bagot Mattress Factory. She was pretty enough, but she didn't really stand out among the other beauties in Cabrini High School. Jack Bear certainly did not stand out among the elite of Cabrini High School. He wasn't particularly handsome, wasn't particularly wealthy, wasn't particularly athletic. He didn't have a nice car, didn't have a poetic soul, and couldn't dance. But he was smart. After a few weeks of being ignored by the upper echelon of Cabrini High School, Jacqueline Adams was thrilled when Jack Bear quietly asked her if she'd like to go to Jade Garden for Chinese food. And after her father declared Jack Bear to be nothing but a snake in the grass, a dog in heat, Jack jumped up a few notches in Jacqueline's eyes. Cabrini held an autumn formal and Jacqueline waited for Jack to ask her to that. As the day loomed closer, she finally asked him when he planned on asking her. Can't dance, he admitted to the girl. So she went with Joe Manzella. And suddenly, Jacqueline and Joe were a couple. Jack was a little disappointed, a little hurt. He was also practical. They were 18 years old. They were free to date whomever they pleased. In just a few months, he'd be going to the University of Southwestern Louisiana in Lafayette, Louisiana, and Jacqueline would be going to wherever she wished, and they'd probably never see each other again. But Joe Manzella's little smirk did piss Jack off. Hey, hey Bear, how's it going? Joe taunted. Hmm? Oh, going good, Manzella. And how's Gina doing? Jack asked, referring to Joe's older sister, who had quite a reputation as a 304. Joe was brawny, but Jack was smart. Joe took a swing at Jack and Jack ducked, letting Joe punch the cinder block wall instead. Ooh, I bet that hurt. Jack chuckled as Joe stared in horror at his swelling hand. Jacqueline tried dating a few other boys in an effort to make Jack jealous, then had to admit defeat and come back to him. She did not go to the winter formal or to the spring formal. Jack A. Bear couldn't dance. 29 years later, in apartment 2B, Jack was looking forward to learning to dance. It was Wednesday and Jack wore his burgundy shoes with his medium brown suit, light blue shirt, and burgundy tie. The burgundy shoes were his most comfortable pair. I could have sworn today was Wednesday, Jill, one of the human resources administrative assistants commented as Jack walked past her cubicle. It is Wednesday, Jack said. No, Wednesday is navy blue day, the young woman smiled. With your blue and gray tie, or your blue tie with the yellow dots? Not no more, Jack smiled. We shaking it up a bit. That a new suit? Rhonda, another accountant, asked. No, it's his Friday suit, Bill, one of the IT men said. Oh, Rhonda said, stared at Jack quizzically for a moment, then resumed studying her computer screen. No, Bill, see? It's hung up on something. It won't let me go to the next page. If wearing a different suit caused a minor stir in the office, Jack's leaving 20 minutes early nearly caused a panic. He drove to Tommy's for Boys, a small restaurant next door to the dance school and very nearly ordered his usual of ham and cheese with olive dressing. No, no, you know what? Give me a large shrimp. They're hot sauce, yes, there's hot sauce on the table, yeah. Give me a shrimp and a Coke, Jack ordered. He thoroughly enjoyed his sandwich, checked his watch again, and then walked next door. He sucked on a mint nervously and stood back from the other patrons. They were all couples. Great, you're here. Kizzy beamed, spotting Jack. I'd like you to meet Michelle Melankin, your partner. She had been seven, nearly eight months pregnant the last time Jack had seen her. All he had remembered of her was that she was a pretty and plump young woman with two very pretty little girls, and that her pretty face was splotchy from her tears, then red with her anger. Michelle Melankin stood at four foot eleven and probably tipped the scales at 170 pounds. Her small face was round. Her mouth was a button mouth, her nose was a round little nub in her face, and her big brown eyes were round. Her bright carrot orange hair was tightly coiled, she kept it fairly short. Her jugs were definitely more than a handful. Her belly had not lost all of the fat that carrying a baby had placed there and her backside was round. In her snug jeans, her thighs looked thick, round. All of Michelle Melankin looked round. Hi Bubbles, Jack said, not even thinking as he greeted her. And she burst into laughter. Now why you call me that? 
She laughed. I don't know, he admitted, blushing slightly as they were now the center of attention from the other couples. First thing that came to mind. He found out that her parents had paid for 12 weeks of dancing lessons for her. It was a way to get her out of the house for a couple of hours. But when Michelle had come for her first lesson, Kizzy had to admit, they had no male partners for her. That was fine with Michelle. She had sat and watched the class, admiring their movements. Then Kizzy sent me a text and told me come here this Wednesday, Michelle bubbled. Jack was covered in sweat by the end of the first lesson. Halfway through, he had to remove his jacket. Then Michelle had reached her small hand up, loosened his tie, and unbuttoned the first button on his shirt. She had not thought about it, had just reached up and done it. There, isn't that better? She asked as they made another box. Loosen up, Jack. Let the music move you, Kizzy encouraged. When the lesson finished, Michelle grabbed his hand. You will be here next week? Please say you will. I had so much fun, she bubbled. You had fun? Dancing with an old man. He smiled at her as he picked up his suit jacket. You're not old, she said. Twice as old as you, he countered. Yeah, well, still, she said. I'll be here, he smiled. Dancing with her, he had been attempting to look into her large brown eyes. But his eyes did occasionally drift down to her impressive chest. Then he would realize what he was doing and he'd quickly pull his eyes back up to hers. And she would smile a warm smile at him, and he would blush. But as she bounded out of the building, he watched her large backside in her snug jeans. As if she could sense his eyes on her, Michelle turned at the door and shot him a wide smile. You had fun? Kizzy asked. You know what? I really did. I mean, I know I'm terrible at it, but I really had fun, Jack admitted. Number one, you are not terrible at it. You're a beginner at it, another woman said. And number two, dancing is all about fun, her partner said. Take care of number two and number one will take care of itself. Couldn't have said it better myself, Kizzy agreed. The next morning, Jack reached into the closet for his Thursday suit, then decided he would wear his Wednesday suit instead. Now I'm totally lost, Jill teased as he strolled along the corridor. He just smiled. His cell phone buzzed and he saw it was JJ, so he did answer it. Dad, you got, listen, we, Shauna? JJ stammered into the phone. Your mother driving you nuts? Jack guessed. Yeah, you heard the school let her go? JJ asked. No, they did not, Jack guessed. Yeah, and that guy Brian too, JJ said. Wow, Jack said. Why? I mean, did she say why she got let go? No, I mean, believe me, I did ask, but all she'll say is she doesn't want to talk about it, JJ said. Jack recognized the statement. Jacqueline said it whenever she had painted herself into a corner. She'd just say she didn't want to talk about it. And she'd repeat that statement until the matter was finally dropped. And with Shauna, I mean, the baby will be here in a couple of months and... JJ continued. Okay, I'll talk to her, Jack sighed. They met at Jade Gardens. Jack couldn't help but smile sadly. Obviously, Jacqueline thought it was a date. She'd applied the makeup quite thick, wedged her flabby body into a dress with a low plunging neckline. A year earlier, Jack would have been excited to see her in that dress. He'd be excited about the possibility of sex later on. Today, the outfit looked sad, shabby on an older woman that was not aging gracefully. Well, don't you look nice, he said genially and took his seat across from her. Thank you. And you look, is that? That is a new suit, Jacqueline said. Yeah, I wore the wrong suit the other day, and just about everyone had a heart attack, Jack chuckled. Realized I'd gotten pretty predictable so donated all my old suits to Goodwill and bought all new ones. Well, must be nice, Jacqueline spat, somewhat bitterly. Yes, it is nice, Jack agreed amiably. The waitress came over and demanded to know if they were ready to order yet. You know what, Jacqueline, I know exactly what you're going to order. You order the same thing every time, Jack said. But I bet you a thousand dollars you couldn't tell her what I want. She stared at him for a long moment, trying to think of what he would normally order. You ready order? The waitress demanded again. She'll have an order of the spring rolls and the sweet and sour pork, right? Jack said. Right, Jacqueline said. And I want a glass of iced tea, sweet, and the Kung Pao chicken, and fried rice, Jack concluded the order. So how have you been? Jacqueline asked. I'm fine, Jack said. Work's going good. Got myself a little bachelor pad. Just told you about my new suits. They have gone up a bit since the last time we bought any new suits and Rhonda just announced that she's pregnant so I'll be looking for a temp to fill in. And you? The waitress slapped his sweet iced tea down and Jack nodded politely. He listened as Jacqueline whined about losing her job, how hard it was living with J.J. and his wife. Shauna didn't seem to like her much, 
Deidre was still upset with her, but Penelope and Percy at least were being nice to her. But neither one of them say they have any room, she concluded her tale of woe. So get your own place, you're a grown woman, Jack said as the waitress slapped down their food. With what? My good looks. Jacqueline snapped. I just told you, I lost my job. Well, if you can't use your good looks, then try your charming personality, Jack suggested. Go to hell, Jack, Jacqueline snarled. Just eat, Jack said. Man, every time I get this, I swear it's hotter than the last time I ordered it. As Jack ordered a bowl of chocolate ice cream for her and a bowl of Neapolitan for himself, Jacqueline broached the idea of a reconciliation. Not just no, but hell no, he smiled, even as she leaned forward to afford him a glimpse of her sagging jugs. But why not? She nearly screamed. So I can sit around and wait for the next time you say we've grown apart. And it's not me. It's you. You just need a little excitement. It doesn't mean anything. It's just sex. It'll make us stronger as a couple. Jack asked and spooned a little of the ice cream into his mouth. Jacqueline thought very seriously of hurling her ice cream at him, at his fancy new suit. The waitress came back and slapped the bill on the table. Jack checked the slip of paper quickly and placed his credit card on the small tray. The surly woman immediately bustled away. It might have been hormones, Jacqueline suggested. I mean, I am getting older. My periods are becoming less frequent. And instead of going and seeing Dr. Poyer about it, you decide to screw another man. Jack said and signed the bill, adding a flat 15% tip. But he was so understanding, I mean, you never were always so busy and Brian. Jacqueline whined. I was always so busy with all the crap you decided had to get done right then and there, Jack said and got to his feet. I was always too busy driving our daughter around. He shook his head sadly. Know what I've not heard? I mean, I've heard all this shit. It's my fault. It's hormones. Brian, listen to you, Jack said. But not once have I heard Jacqueline say that she was sorry. Not once have I heard Jacqueline say it's her fault. But I am sorry, Jacqueline said quickly. JJ and Shauna need that bedroom for their baby, Jack said. So, you need to find yourself a nice little apartment or something. And St. Elizabeth Courthouse has a program where they'll help you find a job. Use it. Jacqueline burned another bridge behind her. When she got back to the small bungalow JJ and Shauna lived in, she screamed at Shauna, calling the girl a black witch. Thanks, Dad, JJ said bitterly into the phone. Nah, I talked to your mother and told her y'all needed that room for the baby, Jack argued. Anything she said or did after that, that's on her. Jack nearly caused another panic at St. Elizabeth's Public Utilities when he came into the office on Friday. Instead of his customary medium brown suit, he was wearing khakis and a button-down shirt. But when 510 rolled around the next Wednesday, and Jack came out of his office wearing snug-fitting blue jeans, a baby blue pullover shirt, and penny loafers, his suit draped over his shoulder, there was a mild seismic shock wave that rippled through the building. And you're leaving 30 minutes early? Rhonda asked. Go Jack. Go Jack, Garrett, one of the IT men chanted. At Tommy's, Jack ordered a fried oyster po'boy and a cola. After he finished his meal, he had to agree, the hot ham and cheese with the olive dressing was still his favorite. But, hey, you never know until you try, he said out loud. Michelle was waiting for him and smiled widely, bounding over to greet him. That looks a lot more comfortable than that fussy old suit, she praised, rubbing her hand on his arm. Hi Bubbles, you look good too, he smiled. She laughed with glee at being called Bubbles. He was much more relaxed and truly enjoyed their lesson. Well, back to the kids, Michelle said as Kizzy congratulated everyone on a great class. I'm sure Barry's hungry by now. Barry? Oh, yes, yes, the baby, Jack smiled. How are the tykes? Mealy's really getting to where she's asking why we can't live with Daddy damn near all the time. Mandy's starting to whine about it too, but that's just because Mealy's whining about it. And as long as Barry has a dry diaper and a jugs to suck on, he's happy. Michelle admitted. She flashed him a huge smile when his eyes immediately went to her assists. See you next Wednesday, Bubbles, Jack smiled. I'm going to think of a nickname for you, Michelle threatened. Yeah, yeah, can't wait, Jack said. Percy was the next of his children to call Jack, complaining about his mother. Dad, please do something, Percy whined. She's been here for two days and already Addison's ready to kill her me. What am I? The enforcer? Jack asked. Which was exactly what Jacqueline asked him when he called her to tell her to get out of Percy's one-bedroom apartment. My apartment is only $4.25 a month. You can't tell me you can't afford $4.25 a month, huh? Jack asked her. 
I got fired from my job, Jack. Kind of hard to rent an apartment with no money, Jacqueline shrilled. Jacqueline, we sold the house, Jack reminded her. We each got a check for 42000 What happened to all that money? She didn't answer his question, just begged him to reconsider reconciling. You remember what you said to me when I asked if you wanted to go to the Catskills? Jack asked her. My last vacation? I said, hey, why don't we go to the Catskills? We loved it there last time we went. Remember what you said? No, you know I don't, she snapped. But I'm sure you do. You said, why bother? Well, Jacqueline, why bother? Reconciling? Why bother? Jack said. Penelope let her mother know, as much as she loved her, there simply was no room for her at her apartment. Plus that, mother, you hate dogs. And Samson and Delilah were here first, Penelope said as her two Irish wolfhounds whined and begged for her attention. All right, Jack, where are you going? Jill demanded to know as he strolled past her cubicle, suit in hand. I beg your pardon? He laughed. I don't ask you where you're going every time you leave here. Yeah, but I don't smile like that every time I leave here either, she smiled. Jack knew if he told Jill, before the first cup of coffee was poured the next morning, every employee of St. Elizabeth's Public Utilities would know about it. They had all known he was getting a divorce from Jacqueline and knew why. Women were coming up to him and calling Jacqueline a witch and telling Jack that not all women were like that. And worse, men were either silently patting him on the back or avoiding him altogether. All right, Jill, but you can't tell anyone, Jack said. Oh, you know I won't, Jill promised, eyes alive with excitement. Well, every Wednesday, I mean, you know, after my divorce, I mean, how am I supposed to live off of half? Huh, Jack said. I know, that which Jill agreed. But anyway, I make a few extra bucks being a male model at the ULD art classes every Wednesday, Jack whispered. You what? Jill asked, eyes wide with disbelief. Yeah, the University of Louisiana at Degard? Jack asked. Anyway, they have these art classes? A hundred bucks to take my clothes off and just stand there. I mean, the first time I did it? God was I embarrassed. One girl said she was about to run out of red trying to get my blush down right. But hey, after that, Jack managed to make it to his car before bursting out laughing. He was still chuckling when he entered Kizzy's. Okay, Jackhammer, what's so funny? Michelle demanded, grabbing his hand. He blushed, but told her what he had told the notorious gossip at his place of employment. Both he and Michelle laughed together, her covering her mouth with her dainty hand. Well, I pay to paint you, she admitted as Kizzy called the class to attention. Okay, Jackhammer, you ready? Michelle teased. Yeah. That's what all the ladies call me, Jack said, and Michelle's blush was immediate. I didn't mean it like that, she screeched, slapping his arm. Problem? Kizzy smiled. Yeah, she hit me, Jack Mott complained. You should have heard what he said, Michelle complained. I'll think of another nickname, Michelle promised as they danced. Whatever, Bubbles, Jack smiled and twirled her. That's it, that's it, Kizzy encouraged. A few other couples also encouraged them, and both Jack and Michelle smiled widely. Aya? You want, Jack stammered when Kizzy called an end to the class. Michelle smiled up at him. Her smile didn't make him any less nervous. But he forged ahead. Aya, you want to go grab a cup of coffee or something, he asked. Can't, Michelle said. Remember? I'm breastfeeding. Aya, oh, damn, I didn't even think about that, Jack agreed. But how about a big old malt at Clark's? Michelle smiled, taking his hand into hers. Yeah, that sounds terrific, Jack agreed smiling through his blush. We'll take your car? Michelle decided. But when she stepped outside and saw that Jack drove a smart car, she pushed him toward her minivan. I'm not getting into one of those, she declared. Like trying to fit a basketball into a golf ball. Oh, come on. They're a lot bigger than they look, Jack protested, but got into her minivan. She shot her parents a text message, letting them know she was stopping at Clark's. Yes, it's a date, she texted when her mother asked. And before they could make the less than two-mile drive from Kizzy's School of Dance to Clark's drive-in, Michelle's cell phone buzzed no less than eight times. You, uh, you want to get that? Jack asked. God, no. It's my family trying to drive me nuts, she said after glancing at the display. Michelle did get a large chocolate malt and Jack decided on a vanilla cone. Dipped. So, Jack Rabbit, why do you want to take dancing? Michelle asked as Jack watched the cute waitress skate away, buttocks framed by the customary red shorts. Jack Rabbit, huh? Jack smiled. Yeah, that's what my lady friends call me. God, never mind. Michelle laughed as her phone buzzed again. And quit looking at all them girls in them shorts, she demanded. Oh, 
I was just thinking how hot you'd look in them, Jack blurted out before his brain could tell him to shut up. And before she could answer, a police cruiser pulled up into the slot next to them. God damn it, really? Michelle yelled as her big brother got out of the police car. Got you a problem with your phone? Officer Richard Voisin asked his baby sister. No, I'm ignoring it, just like I'm ignoring you, yeah, she snapped. Uh-huh, Richard smirked. Hi, um, Jack started to say. Jonathan Archibald A. Bear, Sr., Richard said. Done ran the tags on your car. Really? Michelle screamed. I can't even just give me a malt? Richard playfully pinched his sister's nose. Uh, after what Brian did to you, huh? Richard said. Oh, not without us checking him out yet. He nodded to Jack. Don't worry about answering your phone, no. He said as he prepared to walk around his car. I don't already let everyone know Jack checks out okay. I hate you, she yelled at him. Uh-huh, love you too, Richard said, opening his door. Ought to bring him over on Sunday. Jack chuckled and a moment later, Michelle also laughed. I'm so sorry about that, she said. God, what an uncomfortable first date, huh? Actually, I think this is a great first date, Jack said. And that's what I'm going to call you. She shrilled after giving her malt a big slurp. Archibald, huh? Achi. Ah, uh, God, don't, he protested. Ah, oh, but Achi, she teased. Her phone did buzz a few more times, but she ignored it as they ate their ice cream treats. When she pulled up next to his car, the only car on the parking lot of Kizzy's School of Dance, they continued to quietly talk. Michelle could see that Jack was growing more and more nervous. Achi, you trying to kiss me? She finally asked. I, uh, I, yeah, he admitted. And she pulled him by his shirt front and kissed him. Give me your phone number. You're coming over for Sunday dinner whether you want to or not, she said after they broke apart. 31 messages, she asked, looking at her cell phone display again. Really? With another long kiss, Jack got out of her car and opened the door of his car. He smiled, waved, and then drove away, leaving her to answer 31 text messages. Jack walked into the building and Whitney, the sweet, empty-headed girl that sat behind the front desk in the lobby blushed as she greeted him. On the third floor, some women blushed, others avoided eye contact. And a few of the men chuckled. Garrett smiled and gave him a thumbs up. Then Jack remembered what he'd told Jill the previous evening and couldn't help but guffaw out loud. Won't tell no one. Huh? He asked Jill when he saw her in the break room. Oh, but I didn't, she denied. Face a mask of guilt. That Sunday, he checked out okay, especially since he wore his Saints pullover shirt with khakis. And see? Man knows how to tuck that shirt into them pants, Michelle's father. Barry Voisin said to Michelle's older brother. Mr. Achi, we go swimming at your house again. Amelia? Mealy Melankin asked. Well, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I don't live in that house anymore, Jack said. Then he remembered his apartment complex did have a swimming pool. Quite often he would come home from work and see the various beautiful and not so beautiful bodies in and around the pool. But my apartment does have a swimming pool, he said. Well, can we go swimming at your apartment? Mandy asked. Fine by me, Jack agreed. Do you really want to see this body in a bathing suit? Michelle whispered. Good God, yes. Jack said emphatically. Achi, you are so bad, she laughed out loud. He checked out okay. Especially when he told Barry and Richard that he generally went down to Red Sports Bar to watch the Saints play. Oh man, they used to have them the hottest wings, yeah? I swear you couldn't feel your tongue after, they still got them wings. Barry asked. Yes, both Jack and Richard said. If anyone thought it just a little odd that Michelle's beau was 20 years older than her, no one said anything. Jack and Barry reached for the last biscuit to sop up that last bit of rice and gravy and smothered steak. Marie Voisin wrapped Barry's knuckles with her spoon. He our guest, yeah, you give him that biscuit, she ordered her husband. But I need me that biscuit, Barry whined, patting his ample belly. Look, I'm about waste away, yeah. Oh, well, I sure wouldn't want that happen, no, Jack said. Go on, get you that last one. No, no, you look hungrier than me, Barry smiled widely. Okay. See you on Wednesday, Jack said after telling Michelle's six brothers and sisters and Mealy and Mandy and her mom and dad goodbye. I got wait that long, Michelle asked. Well, no, we can go side by side and then foxtrots. We've been practicing enough, huh? Jack said. Who, side by side? Marie asked. Man, Barry, why you don't take me side by side, huh? Because I'm cheap, yeah, Barry said. We taking my van, yeah. I ain't getting in that itty bitty thing you call a car me, Michelle said, wrinkling her nose at his smart car. Ah, oh, what you talking about? That? 
That's a Mercedes-Benz Yap, Jack said. That ain't no Mercedes-Benz. Michelle hooted. Yeah, it is, yeah, made by Mercedes-Benz, Jack said. They hugged and kissed for as long as they felt comfortable with her entire family watching. Then Jack promised he'd be there at 6.30 the following evening. Jack was amazed at how easily he had slipped back into the dialect of his youth. His mother's parents spoke only a little English, speaking mostly Cajun French. His father's parents spoke a heavily accented English, and when frustrated or excited, slipped into their Cajun French. Many conversations around the dinner table were a mixture of English and Cajun French. When Henry Jonathan Hebert and Elise Cynthia Arnaud Hebert wanted to keep something out of their children's ears, they spoke in Cajun French to each other. Little did they realize that their three boys all understood Cajun French. In high school and in college, Jack had slowly lost that accent. As an administrator at St. Elizabeth's Public Utilities, he did his best to enunciate his words clearly, without the Cajun accent. But an afternoon around the Voisin table had put him right back into his heritage. He logged onto the internet, located the telephone number for Side by Side Steakhouse and left a message, requesting a table for two at 6.45 the following evening. Even a phone call from his ex-wife did not spoil his good mood. Hi, Jack. It's me, she simpered. See that, he said, fighting against slipping into a Cajun accent. Jacqueline had mocked the accent when she was out of earshot of his parents. She also mocked their cooking, labeling it unhealthy. Despite what y'all might believe, grease is not a food, she would sneer. So, Jack fought against giving Jacqueline any ammunition to fire at him. So, how have you been, she asked. I been. You know what? I've been good, yeah, Jack said, then winced. Well, I finally did it. I broke down and got myself a little place, Jacqueline said. Oh, well, that's good to hear, Jack agreed. So, uh, I was wondering, uh, maybe you might want to come over? Jacqueline cooed, ramping up the false charm. What? Why? Jack asked. Oh, you know, see the place. I'll fix stuffed bell peppers that used to be your favorite, remember? Jacqueline said. Jacqueline, I don't think so, Jack said. And just like that, Jacqueline's false cheer was swept away. She became whining, self-pitying. She threw in that none of their children would talk to her any longer. I mean, Deidre, my baby, hung up on me. Believe that, she sobbed. I, uh, well, I'm busy tomorrow, Jack relented. How about Wednesday? Jacqueline quickly suggested, her tears drying as quickly as they began. No, got plans on Wednesday too, Jack said. Doing what? Jacqueline demanded to know. Jack thought very briefly of telling her what he told Jill. I take a course at school, brushing up on a few things, he said. It wasn't a complete lie. Over the years, he had taken courses at the University of Louisiana at Degard, and he was brushing up on his skills. He just didn't feel like telling her he was brushing up on his dancing skills. Well, how about Tuesday then, she suggested. Yeah, okay, he said. At 10.30 Monday morning, a young lady named Lacey called his cell phone and confirmed that he had a reservation for two at Side by Side Restaurant for 6.45 that evening. We look forward to seeing you, Mr. A. Bear, the young lady said pleasantly. Not as much as I do, Jack joked and Lacey giggled. Michelle also giggled when Jack called her to remind her that they had a date that evening. Like I'm thinking anything else, she asked. With a love you achi, Michelle disconnected the call. Jacqueline had not said, love you until they'd known each other for nearly a year. And then it had been a response to his own declaration of love. And Jacqueline had not given him any term of endearment. The only time she'd ever called him honey or baby was when she wanted something. Again, at 6.30, Jack had to greet Michelle's entire family of mother and father and brothers and sisters and nieces and nephew. She only had the one nephew, named Richie, and Mealy and Mandy and Barry, who gave him a toothless grin. Michelle was dressed in a dress that was just a little bit too small for her. It was obviously her best dress. And obviously, it had been bought for her quite a while ago. Jack guessed the dress had been purchased before pregnancy with Amelia. Damn, Bubbles, I need to go home and get real dressed up, yeah, Jack said, even though he was wearing a nice black pinstripe suit, crisp white shirt, and blood red tie. What? You looking good, yeah, she asked. Yeah, but not near good as you know, he said, and she blushed proudly. How come you don't say nothing like that, huh? Marie asked Barry. Cause then I be saying it all the time, yeah, Barry said and kissed his wife. Oh, you fibbing, yeah, she laughed and kissed him. I'm give y'all a police escort, Richard joked. Do and I kill you, yeah, Michelle threatened. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. A. Bear, the hostess at the restaurant greeted them. Right this way. Michelle looked around the fancy restaurant in awe. 
the best place Brian had ever taken her to be Casa Ol Mexican Restaurant. Her menu had no prices and she asked about that little fact. Sweetheart, it's so you don't worry about what you're ordering, Jack said quietly. He took her small hand into his. You get you whatever you want, he said. Whenever we're together, you get you whatever you want here. Looking into his brown eyes, Michelle felt her insides turn to liquid. I love you, yeah, she blurted out. Then her big brown eyes got even larger and her mouth opened in a silent gasp. I mean, she tried to correct herself. Oh, I'm so happy hearing that me, cause I'm in love with you, yeah, Jack smiled. You are, Michelle gasped. The ribeye was cooked to perfection, the outside seared, sealing in the natural juices of the thick cut of meat, and the inside was a light pink. Michelle tried gamely to finish it, but only managed to eat half of it. Jack managed to eat all of his T-bone, but both agreed that dessert would have to wait. At Foxtrot's, Michelle leaned happily against him as the band played a waltz. Jack could not keep his hand from running along her spine, feeling the thickness of her body. He realized that she wore no bra underneath the snug garment. As if she guessed what he was thinking, she giggled. And all I got on is some pantyhose, yeah, she whispered to him. To prove her point, she thrust her crotch against his leg. What a difference a day makes, huh? Jill asked as Jack left his office, dressed in his usual Wednesday duds of jeans and pullover shirt. Huh? Jack asked. Well, yesterday you walked out of here like your dog died, Jill pointed out. And tonight? You got that Wednesday night smile on that face. Jack smiled wider and continued toward the elevator. Last night, he had gone to his ex-wife's new apartment. Jacqueline had rented a one-bedroom apartment. She had about 200 square feet more than Jack did. The complex was a nice one. There were no disabled cars in the parking lot. The grounds were clean. The interior was clean, plain, with white walls and beige carpet. The stuffed peppers were fine. Jacqueline had prepared a broccoli casserole to go with the stovetop peppers. At the Voisin house, they bowed their heads in prayer before the feeding frenzy started. Ever since Sunday's lunch, Jack had started praying, blessing his meal. I'm not poisoning you. You don't have to pray, Jacqueline hooted when he bowed his head. Through the dinner, Jacqueline complained. She complained about how high the rent was, how expensive the furniture had been, how boring her job at the courthouse was, how loud her neighbors were. And once again, she broached the idea of a reconciliation. Did you hear me? Jacqueline asked, fighting to keep the irritation out of her voice. Jack finished chewing the mouthful of casserole, took a sip of her muddy iced tea, and faced her. What made you want to cheat on me? He asked bluntly. What? What's that got to do with? Jacqueline sputtered. Got everything to do with it, Jack said. He put his napkin on the table. Jacqueline, for whatever reason, you thought you'd go off and screw Brian Melankin. I told you don't do it. I told you I wasn't okay with it. Told you it would cost you our marriage, but you still went ahead. Only reason you didn't? I kind of messed that all up, huh? I really didn't think, Jacqueline weakly admitted. I know. You really didn't think I'd put up that much of a fight. Really didn't think I'd leave or divorce you. Really didn't think you wouldn't get your way like you always did, Jack sighed. See? Jacqueline shrilled. You're just as much to blame as I am. You always. Jacqueline, I still ain't heard you say you sorry, he said and got to his feet. You're not finished. You still got. Jacqueline protested. Oh yeah, I'm finished me, Jack said and strode to her door. Don't be calling me no more. Huh? We ain't got nothing to say. He stopped at Clark's and got a chili cheeseburger and a vanilla malt. I'd be afraid right around in that thing, his waitress admitted as she looked at his small car. Uh-huh but I get 42 miles to the gallon, Jack pleasantly agreed. When he got to his apartment, he and Michelle sent text message after text message to each other until it was 10 o'clock. Good night, Ah Chi, she sent, along with a kissy face. Love you, good night, he sent. Love you more, was her response. I know, was his response. He laughed when her response was a smiley face with the tongue sticking out. Now, it was Wednesday afternoon, and Jack was looking forward to dancing with his bubbles. Whitney wished him a good evening, even as her plain face was blushing hotly. A hot ham and cheese paboy, with olive dressing and a few dashes of hot sauce, and Jack was fueled and ready. Achi! Michelle exclaimed and bounded over to greet him. Hi, Bubbles, he smiled, appraising her outfit. You looking good, yeah. They danced, Kizzy calling out the moves, corrected whomever needed correcting, praising those that didn't. When she announced the end of class, Jack bent and softly kissed Michelle's lips. This, uh, this is Brian's weekend with the kids, Michelle coyly said. What you thinking? I'm thinking I want to make love to you, Jack blurted out. She got on her tiptoes and kissed him. Okay, 
That sounds good, yeah, she agreed. On Thursday, Jack spoke, man to man with Barry, Michelle's father. He found out that Michelle's wedding had been a hurried one, there had been no honeymoon. So, Jack planned for a romantic weekend getaway. And on Friday, he left work, at noon. Jack had to laugh. Jacqueline's Mercedes Benz sat on the lot of Superior used car lot. They called them pre owned, but even the salesperson had to agree they were used cars. Know what? Yeah, give me that one. Jack agreed and bought Jacqueline's car. Then he went in his tiny apartment and packed his suitcase. His good mood did sour slightly when he pulled up to the Voisin house and saw Brian Melanchon struggling with both Barry's car seat and Mandy's car seat. Mealy was already in the front seat of the car, buckled in. Then a thought hit Jack. Here, let me, he said, taking Barry from Brian. You get Mandy. Hi, Mr. Achi, Mealy greeted him. You're not going hit me, huh? Brian asked, fearful. Huh? No, no, go ahead, get her, Jack said as he quickly attached the clip of Barry's car seat to the seat bar. Then he went around and kissed Mealy on her forehead and kissed Mandy as well. You get a minute. Me talk to you, yeah, Jack said to Brian. Doing anything, uh, how about Monday night? Monday? Uh, no, no, I'm not doing anything, Brian agreed. Then Jack helped Michelle with her suitcase. The drive down took two hours, two hours of nothing better to do than to talk, to get to know one another. Michelle revealed that Brian had been a friend of Richard's and had always been so nice to her. I mean, I know I'm fat, yeah, but he's always telling me hi and telling me I'm pretty, Michelle said. Hi, you pretty, Jack said. And because I'm all allergic to latex, Michelle said. I bet I know what you fixing say, Jack said. He did tighten his lips slightly. He bought a 12-pack of condoms. But if Michelle was allergic to latex, they'd either have to forego sex or take chances. The way she looked in her snug pink blouse and khaki shorts, Jack's hope was that they'd be chancing it. The way she kept squeezing his hand, obviously Michelle hoped they'd be chancing it as well. Baton Rouge traffic was its usual nightmare and Jack breathed a sigh of relief when they were finally in Gonzales. Bourbon Street was an eye-opening experience for the girl that had never been out of Degard, Louisiana. The Café du Monde was a treat. Jack agreed that they'd eat there every day. But as night enveloped the city in velvet warmth, Michelle took Jack's hand and looked up at him with her big brown eyes. Let's go back to the room, she suggested. She chattered nonstop on the walk to the hotel, she chattered nonstop in the rickety old elevator, and she chattered nonstop as he fumbled with the keycard. He pulled her to him and hugged her tightly, then kissed her. Bubbles, you nervous? Jack asked her quietly. No, Michelle denied, then nodded her head, burying it in his chest. You about see me all naked and I'm all fat, she admitted. And you all beautiful too, Jack said. He did not bother to deny that she was fat. She was a good 40 to 50 pounds overweight and she knew it. Any attempt on his part to deny that she was overweight would have looked disingenuous, dishonest. So Jack told Michelle the truth, she was beautiful. Whether she was fat or not, she was beautiful. He pulled her to the bed and pushed her gently. She sat on the edge of the bed and watched as he turned off the two lamps in the room. Then he made sure the curtains were drawn tight. There, he said, feeling along the bed until he touched her. Now I can't see you. He kissed her deeply. But I can feel you, he whispered, letting his hand travel up and down her pudgy arm. And I can feel you, she whispered back. I love you, yeah, Achi. He interrupted their kisses and pulled her blouse up and off. Then he kissed her some more. Michelle then pulled his saint's pullover shirt up and off, and they kissed a few more times. You are just so beautiful, Michelle, he whispered. Why I ain't bubbles, she asked. Who knows? Jack asked, and she laughed. Sorry, she mumbled. What? Why? God, you are just so sexy, bubbles, Jack protested. Their kisses had been passionate, loving kisses. Upon hearing his declaration of love, then she pushed him back onto the bed and swung herself over and straddled him. She continued to kiss him, almost ferociously as her small hands rubbed all over his chest and belly. Jack also ran his hands all over Michelle's back, arms, and chest, when he could reach her chest. Ah, share. Ah, ah, chi. I want you, yeah. Michelle grunted and slid down so she could unbuckle his belt. He also reached between them so he could unbutton her khaki shorts. Underneath her khaki shorts. Like my big old butt, she asked as she tried to push his khakis and boxers down but his weight was pinning slacks and underwear in place. Love, love, love your big sexy bums, he admitted. He then made her squeal when he rolled her off of him and onto her back in the center of the bed. He did not bother unlacing his shoes, just kicked them off, and then slithered out of trousers and underwear. 
Her tennis shoes did not get unlaced either. They were just jerked off of her feet. But her white socks were left on. Jack remembered that Michelle often complained of cold feet. Then he was on top of her, pinning her against the soft mattress. They kissed. They both had amazing and wild sex. For several long moments, they both gasped for air. Be right back, he promised. A moment later, Michelle tried to cover herself with her hands as the bathroom light flickered on, bathing the hotel room in a soft light. Then the light flickered off, and a moment later, she felt the bed jostle as Jack crawled into the bed. Ooh, cold? She giggled. Oh, sorry, here, let me warm you up, Jack chuckled. And Brian wanted to cheat on this woman? Jack thought to himself. You a lot bigger than Brian ever was, yeah, she declared, popping her mouth off of him. Then she swung her leg over and straddled him. Like that big old butt, huh? She laughed happily. Love, love, love that beautiful butt. You hear? He declared and cupped the mounds of flesh in his hands. It's beautiful. You're beautiful, she said. She then looked at him and nodded approval of his body. We can turn that light off now, yeah, she ordered. Okay, Jack agreed. He turned the light off. A moment later, the other bedside lamp clicked on. Hey, Michelle protested. What? Jack smiled at her as he pulled down the comforter. I turned that light off. You didn't say nothing about this light. Achi. You crazy, yeah. She laughed, throwing a pillow at him. The laughter did the trick. She lost her embarrassment over her body. But he turned the light off. It was bedtime. They snuggled against each other, prepared to fall asleep. Ah, she suddenly gasped. I can't believe I was about go to sleep and ain't said my prayers. She wiggled out of the bed and, still nude except for socks, knelt down by the side of the bed. A moment later, Jack got out of the bed, knelt down next to her, and bowed his own head in prayer. Brian looked nervous, anxious. Jack ordered a cup of coffee, had the girl at the counter add evaporated milk, then approached the table. Hi, Brian. How's it going? Jack asked, nodding in greeting as he slid into the bench across from Brian. Uh, good. I'm good. You? Brian stammered. Me? Good, yeah. Got a crock pot of black bean soup simmering waiting for me get home, Jack said and blew on his coffee. I, uh, so, uh, what you want to see me about? Brian broached the subject. Why'd my wife want to cheat on me? Jack blurted out, deciding to get right to the point. Huh? Brian asked. He played several scenarios over and over in his head. But Jack's blunt question had not been one of the imagined scenarios. Jack swallowed his scalding hot mouthful of coffee and put his cup down. Anything she asked for, I got it for her. That huge monstrosity of a house? God, I hated that place. But Jacqueline just had to have it. Her car? She had a perfectly good Lincoln, but just had to have her a Mercedes Benz, Jack said. He looked at Brian. I'm just trying to understand me, he admitted. Give her anything she want. Don't never cheat on her. Beat her. Don't gamble. Then she just up and say she's going have her a little fling ya, and I'm trying to see why. She was getting older, Brian said. What? Me too. We all getting older, Jack sputtered. Brian held up a hand. You said you wanted to know why but I can't tell you if you're too busy running your mouth, Brian said. They stared at each other for a long moment. Finally, Jack nodded his head in agreement. She's getting a little older, Brian continued. And her youngest is now out of the house, D or Debbie or something. Deidre, Jack agreed. And she's feeling old, undesirable, Brian continued. He smiled and shrugged. All it took was a, wow, don't you look nice today? And you really have a daughter old enough to be in college? And Jacqueline was smiling and laughing. Brian admitted. Damn it, I told her all the time she looking good, yeah, Jack spat angrily. Yes, but from you? It doesn't count, Brian said. You the husband. Now, that doesn't mean you can get away with not saying it to her, but it just doesn't count. Brian drained his own coffee cup and looked at the counter. Go ahead, Jack said. Get you another. Brian did and returned. Anyway, she's smiling at me, she's flirting a little bit with me. It's flattering that a much younger man is showing her any attention. Brian picked up his tail. He blew on his cup then jerked when his lips made contact with the hot muck. It is hot, Jack agreed, sipping at his own coffee. That's how I screwed Cindy, the school secretary, Stacy, the chemistry teacher. That's the one Michelle caught me with, Brian said. Both men sat for a long moment. All it takes is a little attention, and then they start telling you about their husband. He doesn't pay them any attention. He doesn't take them out to eat. He would rather sit on his bum and watch TV, Brian said. He took a sip of his coffee and winced slightly at the heat. You just bought yourself that smart car, Brian remembered. 
and all I had to do was ask her if you were still mourning the Saints losing season, and she started telling me all of your faults. Brian shrugged. Oh, he bought himself a new car? And it's impractical? What a selfish bastard, Brian suggested. Oh, he doesn't take you dancing? He would rather watch football? I'll bet he doesn't treat you right in the bedroom either, does he? Never mind Monday through Sunday, I'm busting my bum for her, yeah, Jack snarled. Most husbands do, Brian admitted. But all I have to do is suggest that it isn't enough. Jack emptied his coffee mug, even though by now the coffee had turned bitter in his stomach. And Michelle fell for you, he asked, more to himself than to Brian. Uh her? Always the fat little kid. All it took was telling her she was cute, Brian scoffed. Worst piece of. He clammed up remembering that he'd seen Jack outside of Michelle's home on the previous Friday. So when the serpent left the Garden of Eden, he became an English teacher, Jack thought to himself as he got to his feet. He had to smile, though. Brian Melanchthon was a skilled seducer. But Michelle had told Jack, Brian Melanchthon had few skills as a lover. The first time they'd made love in a New Orleans hotel. We doing that a lot. Here, she gasped and wheezed. And according to Michelle, Brian had never brought her to multiple orgasms. But Jack could attest to the fact that Michelle was certainly capable of multiple orgasms. Screaming, sweaty orgasms. Jack smiled tightly, wished Brian a good night, and left Jitter's coffee house. Jack drove to his little apartment, ladled out some black bean soup, then had to add some more hot sauce to it. And he and Michelle sent each other text message after text message. Tuesday morning, Jack not only woke up with a smile, He'd been waking up with a smile on his face for a while now, but he also did not feel like a failure, a loser. He had carried those nagging questions around for a while. Why did Jacqueline want to cheat? Was this her first time cheating? How had he failed as a husband, a provider? But he saw, much more clearly, he had not failed. He may have taken his eye off the ball, so to speak, but it was not his failure. He also realized he'd outgrown the bachelor pad he was renting. Epilogue. Tonight was their twelfth lesson. Jack had signed them up for 12 more lessons and had paid for both he and Michelle's lessons, even though Barry, Michelle's dad had offered to chip in a little bit. What? Why? You ain't one dancing with her. Jack had smiled as Mealy held on to one hand and Mandy held on to the other hand. Now, tell me again why we got to go to McDonald's? Cause, Mr. Achi, they got hamburgers and french fries and you can get a malt and then you can go and play on the slide they got there. Mealy had patiently explained again why they had to go to McDonald's to eat dinner. And they got a prize in the box too, Mandy agreed. Now, as Jack and Michelle twirled around on the dance floor, dancing together with a fluidity, a beauty of movement, Jack smiled down at Michelle. She smiled up at him, face flushed with excitement, happiness. Hard to believe, 12 weeks ago you didn't know your left from your right, Kizzy complimented. The music began to fade and Jack twirled Michelle out of his grasp. Then, as Michelle twirled back, he got down on one knee. Michelle looked at him, confused. The other couple stopped and looked at Jack and Michelle as the two were in the center of the large room. Michelle Voisin, I love you with all my heart, Jack said loudly, firmly. Will you marry me? He held out a beautiful yellow gold ring with a one-carat diamond, flanked by four smaller diamonds. Michelle goggled at the ring, then tackled Jack, bringing him down to the floor as she lay on top of him, kissing him frantically. Oh, Achi. She cried and laughed. The other couples applauded, laughing as Jack struggled to get to his feet again. I take it that's a yes? Kizzy laughed as Michelle finally got off of Jack. And you all coming to my wedding here? Michelle ordered as she stared at her ring. Really, Dad? JJ teased when Jack called to tell him the good news. Uh, oh, my stepmom's younger than me? Deidre pretended to be upset that she would no longer be the baby of the family. Mealy assured Deidre that she would love being a big sister, though. It's great she explained. I get to stay up a whole 15 minutes more because I'm the big sister. So, I get to stay up another 15 minutes more than you? Deidre asked, amused. Yes, Mealy assured her. Dad, why they keep calling you Mr. Achi? Percy asked as they all walked around Jack's new home. JJ, Shauna, holding their son Trey, Percy, and his wife Addison, with her belly looking ready to pop at eight months of pregnancy, Penelope and her partner Alyssa, and Deidre turned to hear the explanation. First time I saw Michelle, I called her Bubbles, Jack said. Bubbles? Alyssa asked, Cupid doll face crinkled in a smile. Don't know, she was just bouncy and bubbly and it just came out, Jack admitted. And then I find out his middle name's Archibald, Michelle said, taking his hand in hers. And he's a huge Saints fan, Penelope nodded her head in understanding. 
Archie Manning is still the greatest quarterback the Saints ever had, J.J., Percy, and Penelope echoed what they'd heard all of their lives. As Mealy and Mandy were showing their new big brothers and sisters the stakes that marked out where their swimming pool was going to be dug, Deidre sidled next to her father. Sorry, Dad. I kind of let it slip out about you and Michelle getting married next Saturday, Deidre admitted. Honey, so? I'm not keeping it secret from your mother, Jack shrugged. He smiled as Mealy promised Shauna that she'd teach Trey how to swim. Well, she got kind of mad, Deidre said. Her own damn fault, Jack said. It's her own damn fault. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.